Welcome to week two. Um, I'm going to get my stuff together, kind of write on the board, make sure we know where we can write on that. Um, but as you guys come in, feel free to drop a comment and say howdy. And today we're going to look at the chapter two collaborative problem solving session. Hi, welcome to Wednesday. Sorry, it's a crazy semester. I never know what day it is. So, if you guys are gathering your things, which is probably just like a piece of paper, um, at some point you probably want to print out your periodic table. Um, I brought handouts, but you can't have them because I'm the only person here. So, um, if you have one of these, go ahead and grab it. If you don't, don't worry about it. This is the periodic table that I linked in the Canvas announcement on Friday. Um, so if you have that, you can go into Canvas, click on it, pick, pull it up. Um, if you don't have access to Canvas because you have one device and it's kind of hard to do that, um, the textbook has one in the front cover. You can basically pull one up anywhere, but you will need a periodic table pretty much for most of the remaining chapters for the rest of the semester. On the back of mine, it has the common ion table, which, sorry, um, you guys do need to know. You can ignore this statement about the nomenclature quiz. That's just because this is an old printout. So it looks like you guys are all getting here today. We'll give people a few more minutes before we get started. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the box. I am going to go over some announcements, which um, is not anything new or different than what will come either in last week's announcement or the announcement coming up on Friday. Um, but I mostly want to make sure we are all along the same path as the semester kind of percolates along. So, um, let's see, what other excitement do I have for you? Oh, I graded all of your about me's. It was really nice to get to meet all of you. Um, some of you have comments. Most of those comments are things like, you forgot this piece or you didn't include this. Um, if I told you to reach out to me, you can comment back in that and it will send me an email. You can also send me an email. Both of those work. Um, that will work. So let's see other excitement. So that is graded. Um, it looks like, so it looks like some people are here. We'll go ahead and kind of get moving into the ideas. So one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of, it does not appear. Now, YouTube Live counts, in my opinion, are not always super accurate. So it looks like a lot of people show up to the lives and not very many people are watching the videos. So just so that you can hear it in a different way, the way this class is gonna work is kind of a mix between a asynchronous, meaning not together, and synchronous. So you're responsible to watch the videos. So those videos come out supposedly every Friday evening. Um, that's the goal, and that should be what happens for the rest of the time. So those videos come up sometime between, really whenever you finish your Alex objectives and today, you should watch those videos. If you do your Alex homework without watching the videos, I imagine that it's really hard. Um, so if you don't do your Alex, if you do your Alex homework first, 
then you're going to have to kind of like read all of the definitions. It's going to take a long time. That's hard. If you watch the videos first and then try your Alex, that's one way to do it. I also recommend that you pop into this first. Um, I look at the objectives that I've assigned and try to make sure that all of the examples are somewhat similar to your Alex homework. So the way I think about this course is like this. On Friday, I post the videos. On Sunday night, you have assignments due, the weekly assignment and your Alex objectives. And then on Monday, it starts a new week. You'll watch the videos, you'll come to this, and then you'll start your Alex homework. Or maybe you kind of look at Alex and are like, mm, I don't know how to do this one objective, so I'll wait and see what Dr. Malcolm says, okay? So those are all of the different options. So then you come here, the weekly assignment opens today at five. So a number of you commented in your about me's, like what is this weekly assignment? That was the weekly assignment. So I think the next one opens tonight. I know it opens tonight. A couple of things, you have to upload a PDF of your work. You will write your work by hand or you can write it on, what else can you write it on? You can write it in a tablet and take like upload a picture, but it has to be a PDF. So you're gonna upload a PDF. If your work takes you more than one page, you need to make sure it goes into one file. In the assignment, it gives you some tips and hints and tricks on how to do that. Uh, I like an app called Cam Scanner. It's really easy. You can either do one page or multiple pages and then it exports, it's easy to upload. Um, so you'll need to do that. It will not take pictures. So it turns out that the pictures are impossible for me to pull up on my computer. So that will need to, those are the two things you'll need to do. So I feel like there are a couple other questions that we've gotten. So Jeremy asked, will the Roman numerals always be provided with transition metals? So what we'll see today and in other cases, the answer to that is kind of. If I give you the chemical name, so if in this case I give you um, vanadium, to chloride, you are in fact provided the Roman numerals. Let's make this move this way so you can kind of see. So in this case, you would be provided that. When you're not going to be provided the Roman numerals would be if I gave you VCL2. So the reason it's not provided here is because you can calculate it from the chloride. So this chloride we know would have a See how minus a negative charge, there's two of them, that means the vanadium has to be vanadium two. So you will be provided a way to get there. In the worksheet that I gave for today, um, I gave you the Roman numerals because some of them are skill building exercises. I hope that helped. Okay, um, Nicole asks, are we expected to memorize the formula for atomic weight? Do you mean the, to calculate the atomic weight for using the isotope abundance? You will need to know how to do that on the exam. Um, my suggestion is the more of those you work, the easier it will be, um, but I, that is not on the equation sheet. Someone had asked for an equation sheet that has been posted. Um, it's, I think in the important handouts document, I will link it. Um, on this week's announcement. Amelia asks, oh, I don't know why I was recommended, but if you want to hang out for Jenkin, feel free. Um, Cassidy asks, what do we upload our work for? The weekly assignment. So every week you will have a single question. So the single question in that case for, um, the single question, you'll upload your work. That work will be graded. It's worth 10 points. So that's what you upload your work for. Um, Paxton asks, can you take a picture, then upload it into a Word document, and then turn it in? It still will only accept a PDF. So. If you have an iPhone, you can download CamScanner. You can also open the Notes app. 
and convert it into a PDF. We will be using that for the exams. It will have to be a PDF. You will have to upload all of your work for the exam. Can you scan your papers and save it as a PDF? Yes. There are a hundred different ways for you to do this. You just need to make it into a PDF. So if you want to take a picture, put it into a Word document, and then convert that to a PDF, that might work. Keep in mind that the goal is for me to be able to open it and read it. So that's the problem. Sometimes when you make some of these, they compress funny, and then I can't read it at all. So however you make it into a PDF works. If, hopefully not on Sunday night, but my suggestion would be to try this in advance. And if you're having problems, send me an email. I will help you figure out how to do it. If you realize that you cannot, cannot, cannot figure it out, send me an email on Sunday night. Dr. Malcolm, here's my attached work. I can't figure out how to do it. We will figure out how to do it, but this is the first time, so maybe it will work, maybe it won't. It's not, I don't want to say not the end of the world, but we do want to make sure, figure it out. Peyton says, PDF converter, free websites that work. There are a lot of different places. If you own a Mac, when you hit print down at the bottom in that window on the left side, it says, um, on the left side, it says PDF. If you click on that toggle window, it will then open that up. Um, I mean, Maya, if you stick around, I'll answer that question at the end of class, which is about 4.15. So I'm super interested in about all of that. So there's a lot of ways to make PDFs, so we can do that. In any case, it's super cool. Okay. If you have other questions, you can go ahead and drop those in. Um, the other thing I want to tell you guys is SI has started. I have no idea because I meant to write down the dates and the times, and I don't see if Megan's in here today. Um, sometimes Megan will be here. We have another girl who's going to help out Sarah. Sometimes they will answer your questions if they're simple and I'm writing things on the board and can't see. So in that case, what you do want to think about is, so SI, why do you go? I will never know if you go, unless you tell me. Um, so if you go, you can tell me, you don't have to. It's just another place to work more problems. They're gonna be run in Zoom. Um, in the past, all, I, I advocate for SI, huge. Megan has been my SI multiple semesters, she's really good. Um, you guys should take advantage of that free resource. If you have questions about it, send me an email. I know Megan sent or has posted some stuff in Canvas, so you can look at those too. All right, let's look at the first question. Whoops. Okay, so first things first, I would like to take one second to apologize for the fact that I'm having some formatting issues. What you'll notice is right here where it says K2SO4, the subscript numbers are not subscript. The platform I'm using makes it a little complicated um, and I'm still figuring that out. I will figure it out. We will make it work. I just didn't realize it was gonna be a problem today when I was trying to upload my slides or the questions. So the first question says, what is the empirical formula for each compound? So what is an empirical formula? An empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio of all of the participants. So if you had, let's think about this in terms of dogs, because dogs are easy. If you have a series of dogs, if you have a group of dogs, you have a dog pack. This is awesome. So in our dog pack, you have five Labradors and you have five Border Collies. So, I promise we are getting to the chemical questions here. The empirical formula is the lowest whole number ratio. So, your dog pack of 10 dogs has a ratio of one lab for one border collie. So, the empirical formula is just the whole number ratio. So, let's look at these examples. So, 
So if we look at A, make sure you guys can still see, we have C2H4O2. So these small whole numbers here, we can divide all of them by 2, which gives you CH2O. So the empirical formula is just the lowest whole number ratio. This is an important fact, and we're going to use it again in Chapter 3. So let's look at B. We have MN206. So both 2 and 6, we are going to basically divide by 3 to get MN03. So in this case, the MN06 becomes MN03. It's, the empirical formula is a simple way of saying, how can we make this, I don't say less complicated, but what is the lowest whole number ratio? So for C, we have C6H6. So the C and the H can both be divided by 6. So we get CH. For D, we have CABR2. Now, when we think about empirical formula, sometimes the molecular formula is the empirical formula because this is the lowest whole number ratio. There's no way to divide CA or BR by the same number to get anything else. So in that case, on Alex, you would just rewrite it or it'll ask, like, is this the lowest whole number? That always works. So the last one we have is k 2 SO4. So for K2SO4, you will look at these and you can see it's almost like you could divide by two, except the sulfur doesn't have a two on it. So in this case, like the previous example, the K2SO4 is in fact the empirical formula. Wow, you guys, look at that. Let me answer this. Wait, the assignment is so all right, next question. The next question. So this is a lot like Alex today. Um, or if you've started your Alex homework, you've probably seen this question. So scientists collect the following data about ruthenium. Ruthenium is 97.3% abundant and has a mass of 98.91 atomic mass units. Ruthenium-104 is 2.7% abundant and has a mass of 103.91 atomic mass units. Calculate the atomic mass. So atomic mass can be... So atomic mass, let's make sure I'm not... Yeah. So atomic mass is equal to the sum of the isotope mass multiplied by the fractional abundance. For all isotopes. So in this case, we're asked to calculate the atomic mass. Make that a little bit bigger. So in this case, we have all isotopes. Um, when we calculate this, we want to be able to look at this. We're basically going to fill this out. So we have ruthenium-99 plus ruthenium-104. So we now know the isotope mass and the fractional abundance for both. So we can plug those in. So for the first one, 
first one, the isotope mass is 98.91, and the isotope abundance is 9730. Now, fractional abundance, like I talked about in the video, is just the percent abundance divided by 100. So we take our 97% and turn it into 0.97. We're going to add to that the isotope mass of 103.91 times the isotope abundance of 0 0.0270. So from here, we can plug this into our calculator. And we got 96.24 plus 2.81. And when we plug this into our calculator, we get 99.05 atomic mass units. Now, I do want to take a second because this calculation is probably the one where sig figs are the worst. Because... We are going to multiply and we're going to add, not at the same time. So in Alex, this is the moment when everyone hates Alex. I get that. So let's talk through the significant figures. So based on the problem, we know that in this calculation, we have four sig figs and four sig figs. So our addition calculation needs to also have four significant figures which we can see here. So in this one, we have five sig figs plus three sig figs. So our answer can only have three sig figs. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Tricky is not the right word. It's not the wrong word. The three sig figs here, a lot of times what we want to do is to make this number only have three sig figs. However, when we add, the number of sig figs has to do with the decimal places. So the 0.24 and the 0.81 allow both of these to be added together, and the final answer needs to have two decimal places. Two decimal places, what's before the decimal place, can basically increase or decrease no matter what. So this is your final answer, and it should have four significant figures. For atomic mass calculations, and we're going to do another example here in a little while. We want to make sure, so what we want to do, because it's easy, is to just plug all of this into our calculator and get out an answer. The problem is that you can end up with the wrong number of sig figs. So I would go ahead and set it up this way and look at both of these numbers and track the number of significant figures as you go through. Doesn't look like we're having any questions. If you have questions about this, go ahead and drop them. I'll answer them in just a second. So our next problem is to determine the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for four different elements. So these are the four different isotopes. So I'm going to make a chart, because I like charts, and charts are cool. Protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we're going to have iron 57, oxygen 17, MN 54, and carbon 14. So... To calculate the protons, neutrons, and electrons is, in fact, a little bit easier than we really think it might be. So we look at this, and it's easy to get overwhelmed. So if we look at our periodic table, which I will try to figure out how to throw up the next time. So we can look for our elements. And so when we look for iron, we find it in the third row, kind of in the middle, we can see that it's element 26. The atomic number is the number of protons and the number of electrons if it's neutral. So we're going to write 26 here. 
and 26 here. So the neutrons, so the protons and electrons, we get that from the atomic number. So the number of neutrons is the mass number. That's not very big. Mass number minus atomic. So I used, if you can kind of see that, those are hashtags that are also number signs. So in this case, the 57 here is the mass number. So 57 minus 26 is 31. So we're going to use the same pattern as we continue in this table. So when we think about oxygen, oxygen is element 8. So we're going to write 8 for the protons and electrons. The mass number would be 17 minus 8, which is in fact 9. So when we think about the manganese 54, we find that in element 25, And so the manganese is 29. And then for the protons, neutrons, and electrons for carbon, it's element 6. And this is 8. Okay. Yeah, Ryan, this is just practice. So this is another way for you to get more help. Um, you only have to turn in two things a week. The weekly assignment... And your Alex objectives. But Alex runs somewhat independently, so you could turn in the whole semester tomorrow. I probably would wait on that. So, all right. So, Ms. J, on the next example, which is coming up in a minute, we'll relook at the significant figures. But we got four sig figs for the answer for the atomic mass number because when you looked at the first number plus the second number, it for addition, it has to do with the number of decimal places. And so the answer was 96.24 plus 2.81. And so those two, um, the tens and hundreds place on both, carry forward. Other questions yet? I'll move out of the way in case you're still writing. All right, looks like we're all on board today. So let's talk about number four. So in these cases, I did give you what the um, oxidation state, which is the charge on the transition metals, if we found them. Um, you won't be asked questions just like this on the exam, on the weekly assignment, or in Alex. These are just practice questions. So we want to predict the chemical formula of the compound that's created between these two elements. So the elements we have are, we have CABR, we have copper one, oops, and oxygen, and then we have potassium, nitrogen, aluminum, and sulfur. Okay, that's stuff. Let's throw this way over here. So that I, that's not going to work either. Hold, please. There we go. Okay, so how do we do this? This is probably one of the difficult topics for Chapter 2. So the trick with this and the ability to form these is also part of the naming. So when we look at the periodic table, it's going to tell us what the charges are on these. So calcium becomes a 2 plus. So now we have a calcium 
2 plus, and we have a bromine minus. So in this case, if we have a calcium 2 plus and a bromine minus, we need to make a neutral molecule. Ca2 plus, Br minus, we're going to need two negative charges to cancel out this positive charge. So we will end up with CaBr2 as our answer. So on an exam, you don't have to show all of this work. This is just work. So let's look at copper one oxygen. So this copper one, this Roman numeral, tells us that it is a plus one. So OK, that's good news. Copper plus. And oxygen, based on the periodic table, is two minus. So OK, well, we, that means in order to get two negative charges canceled out, we're going to use this one positive charge. So we're going to have copper subscript 2, O. So again, we're just looking at the charges and creating a neutral molecule. If you're having questions about, like, how did I know that oxygen was a negative 2? That is in the videos, um, chapter 2, part 3. And it is also in the naming video. It goes through how to know who's who and who's not who they say they are. Okay? So what about potassium? So we have K plus and N3 minus. So that'll give us K3 N. So as we look at this, while we're learning, it makes a lot of sense to step through this phase, to write out the charges and then go on. So for aluminum, we have aluminum three plus, and the sulfur, two minus. Now, three plus and two minus, thus far, we've really just had to multiply one of our elements by a number, and it kind of works out. So in this case, if we had two aluminums and one sulfur, it would not be a neutral molecule. So in this case, we need to figure out how many aluminums and how many sulfurs interact. A lot of my students like to use the do do method. Now, if you didn't grow up in Texas like myself, maybe going to a square dance is not your thing. I haven't been to a square dance in a long time, but you could. So a do do or the, I think the book calls it, somebody calls it the Humpty Dumpty. Um, so in that case, the charges become the subscripts. So what we see is that aluminum two, sulfur three. So we have Al three plus, Al three plus, S two minus, S two minus, S two minus. So the total positive charge here would be three plus, the total negative charge would be six minus. So in this case, you can switch those two and come up with this. All right, so we have some questions. So Kajal asks, for the exams, do we use a blank periodic table or can it have writing on it? I have my charges at the top of the groups. So for the exams, I'm still working out all of the details, and I think it's best. So, sorry, not this weekly announcement, but the next weekly announcement. There will also be a whole separate announcement with all of the exam information. So you don't, don't worry about what you need. Right now, let's just worry about learning the material. Because I'm, I still am kind of, I've got some ideas for the exams. So don't worry about it. You will be provided everything you need from an equation sheet to a periodic table and all of that. So I know that me saying like, don't worry about it yet doesn't really help you. Like, that's okay. But we will get to that in the future. And so if you've written on your periodic table, that's okay. If you have not written on a periodic table, that's okay. If you haven't printed one, I'd recommend that you do that. Cassidy asks, can you do that with all of them? So the do -si do reaction, you can. I've never seen it not work. That doesn't mean that it doesn't. So 
Ling Gang. Yeah, Ling Gang and Carson both say they didn't find the other video. It's titled, it's the next video. It looks different than the other one. So that one is titled, How to Name Inorganic Compounds. I think if you go to the chapter two playlist and look down, there's like the three with the like colored backgrounds and that next video is that. Um, I will try to, on the FAQs page, I will put a hyperlink to that if you guys are having a hard time finding it. So that will help too. Are there other questions? Okay. If you have more questions, feel free to drop them. We're going to do a bunch more examples like this as we go through today's lecture, or today's examples. So, in this case, for the next one, we, in this chapter, kind of started to talk about how we can create ions. So an ion is an element with a charge, and so most of the time, if not all of the time, when we encounter cations or anions, what we've done is we're gonna remove an electron. And so it's worth thinking about how do we calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons for these four ions. So I'm gonna grab my periodic table and think about that. We're gonna have the protons, electrons, neutrons for, make sure you got it, I'm still in the right place, 89 strontium 2 plus, 35 Cl minus, 195 platinum 2 plus, and 75 arsenic 3 minus. So in this case, we have four elements, we have the mass numbers, and we have the charges. This had a heart attack. Strontium 2 plus. So the question becomes, how do we figure this out? So we know that the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. So we're just going to go to our periodic table, find strontium. Okay, that's 38. So we know that there's 38 protons. In order to be a 2 positive, we're going to remove two of the electrons. So 38 minus 2 is 36. The number of neutrons is the mass number minus the atomic number. So 89 minus 38 gives you 51. So what about chlorine? So chlorine has 17 protons. It's a negative. So we need to add an electron. So now we're going to have 18 electrons. And the mass number is 15 minus 17, which gives you 18. So for platinum, this is a big element. So we can find platinum uh, at element 78. So if it's positive, we're going to remove electrons from the number of protons. That would be 76. And here we have 117. So for arsenic, same thing. It's element 33. We're going to add 3 to the number of electrons, and then 75 minus 33 is 42. So calculating the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons is, I don't like to use the word easy, but the trick, if we want to call it a trick, is to find the element on the periodic table. The atomic number, so if you look in the box on the periodic table, there's a whole number and they increase 1 to 118. That is the number of protons and electrons in a neutral atom. If it is an ion, you either add or subtract protons, no, add or subtract electrons. That's it. The number of neutrons is the mass number, which is this number, minus the number of protons. Now, what about if I didn't give you the mass number? How would you come up with that? So let's look at a different element. So let's just pick, um, we'll do carbon. So if we know that there are six protons and six electrons, and we know that there are, also 
also six neutrons, we can come up with the mass number. So the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of electrons, uh, plus the number of neutrons, and that gives us 12. That was not on the worksheet. I just made it up just so we could see an example. So next, we're going to do another of the, I think we can see that. We're going to look at another one of the atomic mass calculations. Now this one is a little different. This one is also similar to Alex. So I'm gonna bring it down just a touch. So when we think about this question, I like this question. So. What is it asking? Try to step out of the way so you can see it. So the atomic weight of lithium is 6.938 atomic mass units. One isotope, lithium-7, accounts for 92.41% of the natural lithium and weighs 7.0160 atomic mass units. What is the mass and abundance of the other isotope? So. This is asking for two data points. So if we remember that atomic mass, yep, atomic mass equals the sum of the isotope mass multiplied by the fractional abundance. That's like impossible to read. So, hold. Let me try that again. Let me make that bigger. So, isotope mass multiplied by the fractional abundance. So, in this case, we have this value, which is what we saw for in the first example. And we have these values, but only for one of the two isotopes. So I'm going to solve this in a slightly different manner than Alex suggests. Alex likes to do some hard math sometimes. I'm going to teach you what I like to call simple math. Both ways get you to the right answer. So the first thing we're going to find out is what is the abundance. So the abundance... is 100.00, so this number, because it's a whole round number, has infinite number of sig figs, minus 92.41%, and that gives us 7.59% abundance. So we can come up with the abundance using math. So that's 100 minus the other isotope gives you this. If you were to have three isotopes, there are ways that you can do this algebraically using x and x minus 100. You can do those. Um, if you have trouble with that, because there are some of those in Alex, I have office hours on Friday morning from 10 to 11, and I will help you solve those questions. So we have the abundance. So now we need to go back to the math calculation. So we're going to have... 6.938 equals the first one, which is 0.9241 multiplied by 7.0160 plus 0.0759 multiplied by x. So x is the atomic mass of the other isotope. So now we're going to solve this calculation. So we get 6.938 equals 6.483 plus 0.0759x. So then what we'll do here is we get that 0.0. 759x equals 0 0.455. So in this case, this is a 
subtraction, all of the decimal points stick around. From here, x equals 5.99 atomic mass units. So the three sig figs came from this value, which came from this calculation. So Cassidy asks, ooh, and people have answered, but just in case. So the total abundance is 100. So basically, we know that there is, in total, 100%, 92 of that, 92.41% of that, accounts for the lithium-7, so the 7.59 is the remaining. So we should at least review the significant figures on this. So significant figures on this calculation, same as the previous one, are complicated because we do multiplication and addition. This is really the only topic where we're really going to see that in Jenkins 1. We'll see it in a few other places, but not usually to this degree. So all of these values come directly out of the problem. So the number of significant figures here is two decimal places because that's how many we have with the 92.41. This 100 has infinite decimal, point, decimal places because it comes from, it is a standard. So if you remember last week, I talked about how conversion factors don't control your significant figures. Same with this value. So when we do this calculation, so this nine, this value, 6.938, came out of the question, four sig figs. We're going to subtract 6.483 from it. So we get 0.455, which has three sig figs because there are three decimal places in both of these answers. If this one had only had 6.48, we would have only gotten to have two decimal places, but it has three, so we went forward. So 0.455 divided by 0.0759, both of these have three sig figs. That gives us a final answer with three sig figs. For this calculation, what I've noticed is a lot of times students get lost. Lost isn't the right word. They lose track of their sig figs. You probably got to the right answer, but maybe you didn't have the right number of sig figs. This is how you can figure that out. Also, you may be like, Dr. Malcolm, you showed so much work. So much work. And so you could probably condense a lot of this work if you wanted to and still get full credit. I will show all of this work on here, mostly so that you can learn. So if you have a question, let me know and we'll be ready to switch so there are three left, and we will finish pretty close on time today. I'm going to wait and see if there are any questions before I erase this. Looks like not so many so far. So in this question, we're going to start looking at creating compounds of polyatomics. So a polyatomic ion is an ion that has more than one atom. So if you look at this example, you can see that some of them have just one element and others have elements stuck together. So what is a polyatomic? A polyatomic is a group of elements that come together to form a compound. They always stick together. So one way I like to think about this is to think about when you invite your friends to a party. Obviously pre-COVID or post-COVID, definitely not during COVID, right? So we all have that friend where if you invite them, they bring their friend. They come as a pair. Everywhere they go, they just come as two. A polyatomic is just like that. The polyatomic does not break apart. So in all of these, we're going to treat them as the whole thing. 
So in this case, if we look at the first one, we're going to have the magnesium ion and the acetate ion in both cases. So before I continue, Nicole asked, for each part of the problem, you use the appropriate number of sig figs to calculate the next part. That is totally correct. And I appreci appreciate aquatic misery thrown in an answer there. So let's look at these examples. So if we have magnesium and the acetate ion C2H3O2 minus, so I gave the ions for the polyatomics, the charges, um, and so, but not for the elements. On an exam, you would get neither. So you do need to know the polyatomics. So magnesium has a two plus charge. So now we can have one magnesium and we need two acetates. The thing is, sometimes what we want to do is multiply the two through the subscripts. That's totally wrong. Don't ever do that. So we're going to use parentheses with C2H3O2. Two. So the parentheses tells you that you have two acetate ions. As we're going to learn in chapter three, and we've kind of started talking about changing it to be this, Mg C4 H6 O4, this is an entirely different molecule. So this is totally wrong. Don't. It, it's really hard to think about like why that's wrong right now, but basically when we do this, it tells us it's something else. So we want to use parentheses and our polyatomics go inside. If there's only one of the polyatomic, you do not need to use parentheses. So let's look at the next one, which uses vanadium three, so V three plus, plus the SO4, Two minus. So in this case, we can use the do -si do or the Humpty Dumpty, whatever way you like to think about that. And we can use, so it'll end up, we'll end up with two vanadiums, an SO4 times three. So this would be vanadium three sulfate. So as you start to do these, you should practice, like, what is the name of this? Which is what we'll be looking at on the next question. So our next example uses ruthenium-2 in the nitrate ion. So uh, we have ruthenium-2 plus in the NO3 minus. So here we're going to have two nitrates for every one ruthenium ion. So we're going to end up with ruthenium NO3-2. So one thing you'll see is that we start to use a lot of parentheses. And as we'll see in the next question, if I gave you this, the RuNO3-2, you could determine the charge on the ruthenium because we know the charge on the nitrate. I will not, as in this question and all the others, just give you ruthenium and nitrate and tell you, figure it out. You will have context clues, which is a nightmare that should remind you um, about whether or not, no. It should remind you of like literature class and that's not what it is. There will be context clues, they will be easy to find out. So last, we have the ammonium ion and we have the NH4 plus and the chloride ion. So ammonia, NH4 plus, is the only polyatomic cation that we're gonna meet this semester. It's the only one. It's a lonely one, but ammonia is a really important, or ammonium, so the ammonium ion, we see a lot. It's also really important in biochemistry. A lot of you guys said that you guys wanted to be biochemists or your biology majors. You'll see the ammonium cation a lot in your career. So in this case, we have the NH4, one plus, one minus, so that can be written NH4Cl. You don't need to put any parentheses in there. You totally can. So you could also write it NH4 bracket CL, but you don't necessarily need to. Okay. 
Genevieve, you had a fire drill? We just worked some examples. And I, I really should check and make sure we're never going to have a fire drill during this. I'll plan ahead. Because um, some of ours are announced. I'm sorry, you had a fire drill. We've just been working examples and talking about significant figures. So Tajal asks, problems are going to be similar like this for the exam. Mm, problems will, the exam questions will probably have more parts. So ones that are a little bit more, as we move forward in the semester, the examples we do in this session will be more likely like the exams. Um, the, the weekly assignments will be similar to exams. Those will be part exams or modified exam questions. So I am going to try to show you an exam, but I, there will be no practice exams or things that are directly from old exams. So it will ask, so the next two questions are similar to what we see in exams. Other questions. So the next question, or the next two, are um, we're going to start to look at the chemical names. So chemical names and chemical formulas. So all of these practice things are all of the tables where I gave you one or the other are so that we can think about how to come up with these chemical names. So. Chemical names. Chemical names are things with letters. So in this case, we're going to look at these five. And one thing you'll notice is that my periodic table, the one I gave you, has the names on it. I would try to use this as much as humanly possible while we learn all the elements. So the trick is to figure out, to ask ourselves, is this metal a transition metal? If it is, you probably need the Roman numerals. Not all of them, but some of them. The other one is to know metals keep their same names, polyatomics have names, and the anions usually turn into an ide. So naming is just the ability to go for A, SRO turns into strontium oxide. So my suggestion as we think about this going forward is to ask ourselves, what is that chemical? Every time you encounter one, try to name all of them. So sometimes they don't follow the rules, and we're not really going to ask about those. But most of them do follow the rules, and the rules are pretty simple. So the next one we're going to look at is B, NB, Cl5. Now, MB. You're like, I don't know, where is that? If you don't recognize it, it's probably a transition metal, right? Transition metals are the ones in the middle, the no rules kids. They don't have rules, and so that's why we give them Roman numerals. So niobium is element 41, right here in the middle. And so, whoa, paper drop. We write that out as niobium, N-I-O-B, niobium. Now, it's a transition metal. We need to say what the charge is. We're going to use the Roman numerals. So Roman numeral 5, chloride. Now, you might be asking, how did you know it was 5? So we know that the charge on a chlorine ion, when it becomes a chloride, is a negative 1. There are 5 chlorides, chloride ions for 1 niobium. So that niobium has a plus 5 charge. That's what this is telling us. So you would either be given this or this to find the charge on that. So next, we have Na2SO4. So we name these left to right, kind of like we read them. So we have Na, which is sodium. The SO4 molecule is the sulfate ion.
So sodium sulfate is the name of this. Now sodium is not a transition metal, so it doesn't need to have a parenthetical charge. So you might also be saying, well, should we say that there, it's like disodium, because there's two? It turns out that we only use those prefixes when we talk about elements that are molecules. So when two nonmetals, basically stuff on this side of the periodic table, which you can't see, stuff over here interacts together, we'll use things like dihydrogen monoxide, otherwise known as water. So if you see those prefixes, it just means there's more than one. You don't need them when it's a metal and a nonmetal or like this. Next. CdCrO4. Now, we know that it's a metal and a nonmetal. The trick is where does it break? So it breaks after the first metal. The CrO4 minus is one of our polyatomics. So this is cadmium 2 chromate. So CrO4 2 minus is one of the polyatomics that you need to know. Next is ZnCl2. And in this case, it's going to be zinc. Chloride. Now, zinc only has one oxidation state. It's only ever plus two. It's never plus one or plus anything else. So in the rare cases that our transition metals don't, and it's like the five or six of them on here, don't actually have um, different oxidation states, we do not include the Roman numerals here. So chemical names can be developed from the formula, and in the next example, we will look at chemical formulas and develop the chemical formulas from the names. Okay, so we have some questions. So the first question from Catherine asks, how do you know it's cadmium-2? So cadmium, if we're talking about D, right over here, can you guys see? Well, well on this side, so it's cadmium-CD, unknown charge, but the chromate is CrO4-2-. minus. And because the chromate is a 2 minus, that means the cadmium has to have a 2 plus charge. So the chromate ion is on that polyatomic ion table. This is a good question, and that's how you can tell in this case. I would always assume that the first unit is, in fact, the metal, and the other rest of it is the polyatomic. So Ms. J asks, why did the 5 go between the two elements in B? So the five goes between the two elements because it's, it's talking about the niobium. So niobium has a, char, a plus five charge. And the chloride, we know what it is because it can't be anything else. So these charges are only related to transition metals and it always goes in the middle. So you also asked why I didn't include the number on the last one. Yeah. So zinc can only ever be zinc 2 plus. So if you look at your common ion table, this sheet. So if you notice in the 2 plus, it has zinc 2 plus and a bunch of other elements. Ooh, it also has cadmium. So technically cadmium didn't need one. But you will not, Alex will take off points I will try not to ask a lot of trick questions. So in this case, because zinc can only be a two plus, you do, need, you do not need that. So for the last question we have today, we wanna write the chemical formula for these molecules. So 
it's kind of the same as this, except for now we're going to go the other direction. So when we think about these, you will always be given the Roman numerals if you need them, except for things like zinc where it doesn't have one. So in this case, for chromium-3 iodide, we know that we're going to have chromium-3 plus and I minus. So we're going to end up with chromium-3 iodide. So it's always okay to go through the ions and say like, okay, does this one mix with this one? Give me that. That's how I would think about it. Today, I can kind of look at it and I don't need to do that, but I used to always do that. So B, we have barium hydroxide, okay? We know that barium is Ba2 plus and the hydroxide is OH minus. So we know that we're going to need more than one hydroxide to cancel out the two plus charge. So we'll get a BaOH2. So we'll have barium hydroxide two. So what about ammonium sulfite? So ammonium is NH4 plus sulfite is SO3 two minus. So sulfite and sulfate are two different polyatomic ions. They look very similar. You'll see the same thing when we talk about nitrate and nitrite or phosphate and phosphite. So in this case, we know that we'll need more than one ammonia to cancel out the sulfate, sulfite ion, sorry. Then we'll take our NH4, two, SO3. So in this case, the ammonia does need parentheses around it, and it doesn't switch places. So you can, if you have a polyatomic as your first ion, it can be up front in parentheses. So next, titanium 3 plus, phosphate PO4 3 minus, and so we'll end up with Ti PO4. So in that case, because the charges are equivalent, we don't need parentheses, everybody just goes in line. So last, we have K plus and three minus, so we have K three N. So naming is really important. Being able to generate either the chemical name or the chemical formula will be part of what we're learning this semester. On exam one, there will be questions that say, don't panic yet, okay? Write the balanced equation for barium hydroxide plus chromium iodide, and that gives you chromium hydroxide and barium iodide. And you'll have to come up with that. now. We haven't talked about balancing equations. A lot of you are very nervous about that. That's coming next, so don't panic. So in that case, those are, the those are what we're gonna start to look at. So what questions do you have today about what we've talked about in class? Have you guys started your Alex? Do you have any other questions? I will post a link on Canvas probably tomorrow. Um, on the what video should I watch page directly, taking you directly to the uh, naming compounds video. Uh, sorry, that one got lost. Other questions. This is all of the examples I have for you guys today. So if you don't, I will hang around for another couple of minutes if you have a question. Um, otherwise, have a great west rest of your Wednesday and stay safe. So if you have questions, let me know. I'll hang around for a couple minutes.
So Ms. J asks, does Alex automatically put up the assignment that you need to complete? Yes. So Alex is super cool in that when you sign in, it will basically say, um, I'm going to draw what you'll see because it's not very good. So Alex will say, like, welcome. And then there will be a button up here. This button will say, keep working, keep working, or it will say, continue my path. And if you click that over here, it will have like a pie with stuff kind of shaded in. So it'll say like, welcome, Hannah. And then up here, it will have a button and it'll say, continue my path. If you click that, it takes you directly into this assignment. If you were to sign in and it says, work ahead, you're done. So if you remember last week, as you work towards the end of your objectives, it would say like, it'll only say it once. So it'll tell you if you finish a pie slice, it'll like confetti your screen, like congratulations, you finished a pie. So it'll tell you that. It will also tell you when you finished all the objectives. So if you go to the next screen, up here at the top, there are tiles. Mm, you get there through a little carrot menu, click it down, then you'll see tiles. You can click around. Some of them might be locked. And so that's okay. It just means that you need to finish one of the other ones first. So Alex will try not to send you into naming if you can't, if you haven't looked at the ones about predicting the ionization state. So Peyton asked, it's unrelated. No, nah, it's pretty related. Is there a list of the polyatomic ions that you have to memorize? Yes. If you go to the announcement from last Friday, weekly announcement something, um, I posted a link to a common ion table. You can also find it in the handouts folder. The ones on that you are responsible for. What are you not responsible for? On this document, on the metals cation side, it uses words like ferrous and ferric to talk about the iron states. We will always call them as Fe3, like iron 3 or iron 2, instead of the ferrous or ferric. Same with plumbus and plumbic or any of those. We will just call them metal ion state. So Colby asks, will you be allowed to use a common ion sheet on our exam? You should memorize this. You need to know all of these. It is my recommendation that you memorize these. So Peyton asked, is Alex all due at the end of the semester or the module synchronous with the lessons? So the way Alex is scored in this class is every week you have assignments that are due. So one week, this week I think there's 10 objectives that are due, but it's scored at the end. And so I like the at the end model so if you turn in all of your objectives on time this week, then you'll have a knowledge check. Let's say you didn't really know one of the objectives and it takes it away. You can earn it back in an open pie period later. So every week you have objectives due, but these total scores are calculated at the end. So you, in this class, you get whatever percent of your pie you complete. If you only do 60%, you get 60 points. If you get 98%, you get 98% 98 of the pie, 98 points. So you should complete your whole pie. And it will like do a little song and dance for you. So that's one option. The other part of your grade is for turning them in on time. If we don't have an on time component, I would wait till the last week and then be really mad that it took me a long time. So that's all that is. So. The Alex is due weekly. You'll sign in. It'll tell you what to do. It should take about two hours, mm, two to three hours a week. So I probably wouldn't wait till Sunday at 11 to start. But after this lecture, you can go in and be like, oh, okay, all these make sense. Great questions. Any other questions? Oh, 
for those of you that are still here, I don't, I can't tell some of you. If you are struggling on Alex, you can send me a screenshot of what you're working on. Also include your work. Cause then I can look at both of those and really help you out and figure out how to help you. Not a problem, always happy to help. All right guys, I'm gonna head out. I have another class after this. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and I will see you next week. Same time, same place. Oh, uh, Angela asked before I ran off, do you have to do the knowledge check each week? There will be knowledge checks basically twice an exam period. So there is one this week and then next week there will not and there'll be one the week after. So you basically will have two in between each exam. One is a status point and the other one will be a, is there anything I don't know before the exam? So you do have to do it. Alex will lock you out of your homework until you do it. But that is independent of the due date. So how, glad you asked. Any other questions before I really run off this time? Doesn't look like it. I hope you guys have a great rest of the day.